movement, such as what you have in Parkinson's, it's scapular dyskinesia. If it's something that, the, that happens as the patient is voluntarily moving their arm, it's dyskinesis. So everything that you see, unless there's a neurologic abnormality, is dyskinesis, not dyskinesia. Just to be pure. So let's look at this scapular dyskinesis. This is a water polo player. Look at her scapular humeral rhythm. Look at her right scapula. This is right before we did her surgery. This is a secondary or uh, distally based dyskinesis. And all she had was a slap lesion. But the, move, the funky movements that you were seeing of her scapula were to get her humeral head away from the superior labrum. So what are the corrective maneuvers that we do? Here's a young man, another water polo player, see a lot of aquatic athletes, who's got limited range of motion and pain, anterior superior pain. He was sent to me for a subacromial decompression. But what happens if I hold his scapula in position? Ben Kibler's scapular assistance test. He has increased range of motion because I was able to do a posterior tilt and externally, help him externally rotate his scapula. So he's got increased range of motion and decreased pain. This isn't a subacromial problem. This is a scapular thoracic problem. Now we test his rotator cuff, and he's very weak in scaption. But when I have him retract and depress his scapula, this can be done either actively or passively, and we can talk about that at, uh, later on. But if I have him put, it, put his scapula in position, he's got much better strength. So when you evaluate the rotator cuff, if you don't have the scapula in position, it's really not a valid test because it's like not having one end of the hammock connected. And then when I test serratus anterior strength, I test eccentrically. So I put them in protraction, and then I test them at 90 and 120 degrees. And in a lot of throwers, what you'll see is they can't even hold their arm at 120 degrees. This kid starts to drift down there, and then as soon as I push down, it just goes. Well, he had a long thoracic mononeuropathy. Um, we're seeing that much more commonly now as kids are carrying heavier and heavier backpacks um, and it's being referred to as backpack palsy. Don't miss the loss of internal rotation deficit. Um, about three weeks ago I saw a nine-year-old in the office who was playing uh, Little League Baseball um, that, uh, that had an internal rotation deficit of 45 degrees. So you want to look at them with the scapula fixed. Um, so you have them supine and you check internal and external rotation and a side-to-side -side difference of more than 20 or 25 degrees is glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. What you have to be careful about when you do this is that you don't push down on the humeral head when you're trying to hold the scapula down. So you want to make sure that your hand is on the coracoid process rather than uh, on the humeral head. And then you want to check for instability. This is a sulcus sign in internal and external rotation. And we'll talk about the significance of that in just a moment. And then you want to do load and shift testing, and you want to see what, they, what their laxity is like um, going posteriorly and going anteriorly, the drawer test. But you've got to compare sides. And this young lady, this is a uh, cheerleader and gymnast. This is her normal side. This was totally asymptomatic. So I, I, when I go to meetings, I see a lot that people are doing the sulcus sign, which is called Nobuhara's test, when you do it in internal and external rotation, and that if you have a positive Nobuhara's test, that you should be thinking of tightening the rotator interval. Well, some people need the rotator interval not to be tight so that they can do the things that, that they want to do. So you have to differentiate between laxity and instability, and instability is patholaxity. And then the lateral decubitus position, somebody with chronic instability will let you do this. Um, and this is, I do this, I started doing this in the operating room, then I started doing it in the office when I realized that if with some finesse you could get the patient to allow you to do this. And you want to check the entire capsule. Uh, you want to get a visual image of what's tight, what's loose as you internally and externally rotate and feel for clicks and grinds. And you want to see, are you going to reproduce the patient's symptoms? Because we see a lot of things arthroscopically that don't necessarily need to be corrected. Certainly not in every patient. So you've got to differentiate between laxity and, and instability. So the choreography of my exam, I make a lot of observations when I'm taking the history and talking to the patient. I'm learning a lot about the patient as I'm doing that, watching if it's a kid, watching the interaction between uh, them and, and their parents. Um, I'm, I get a lot of uh, uh, input about posture, the way they carry themselves. Um, then in the standing position, I, I, look at, um, I look at their posture, I look at their um, lumbopelvic uh, and core kinematics. 
um, and then scapula thoracic, and then you can either do the uh, provocative tests and corrective maneuvers. The corrective maneuvers I do standing. The provocative tests I do either sitting or standing, depending on how the flow of the uh, exam is going. Then I have them go supine. I do my um, uh, uh, stress testing in that position, then turn them in the lateral decubitus position, and then the last thing I do is palpation. Um, and I want to make sure that I palpate last because I don't want to, uh, to aggravate what I'm, uh, what I'm uh, trying to evoke. Um, the pearls are is make sure that you can see the scapula, make sure that you can see the legs, so shorts if possible. Take a worthwhile history and listen to the patient. Try not to interrupt them as, as soon as they start talking. Um, there was a study done uh, at my medical school where they, um, they put, had cameras through uh, uh, one-way glass so that they could uh, see how interviews were being done. And the average time for a physician, when they asked the patient what the problem was, the average time before they interrupted them, 18 seconds. You're not going to learn a whole lot by listening for 18 seconds. Most of the diagnoses on shoulder I think you're going to make based on the history. And then it's confirmed on the exam, and then it's confirmed on uh, the imaging studies. So you want to choreograph the exam. You want to rehearse it. We rehearse pretty much everything else we do. Um, you want to identify the mechanical flaws that lead to the clinical sequelae. Check alignment. Uh, look at core and lumbo pelvic strength and stability, and look for the muscle imbalances. What's short? What's tight? What's weak? And, and we'll talk later about uh, tonic muscles and phasic muscles and what tends to get tight and, and the patterns of muscles that get weak. You want to make sure you look at the scapula thoracic uh, region, range of move, motion and movement patterns. The, what makes it worse? The provocative maneuvers but also what makes it better? What are the corrective maneuvers? And, and that'll tell you whether therapy is the way to go or you're going to have to deal with it as a structural problem. Um, you want to look at glenohumeral stability and of course palpation uh, is last. And don't forget to palpate the coracoid process because it's very common that patients have pec minor tightness, that have pec minor tightness are tender right there. So now I can introduce my two week old grandson, my first grandson. This is uh, Cameron Stewart Block and um, I'd be remiss if I didn't let you all know that he's now with us. So, thanks. Thank